Okay. Perfect. All right. Good. Good afternoon, everybody. So uh, it's a huge pleasure to be here. And uh, as Mukun said, I love coming here, and uh, I think I must have been here five or six times at this point. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you about one of the main threads in my group that I'm really excited about. So let me just cut right to it. So I want to basically talk to you about a puzzle, and it's a very easily stated puzzle, what it, which is, what does this particular genomic sentence mean? That's it. That is the question for my talk. So, but before I get into the details of that, I, I have a f just a few remarks by way of background before we're ready for it. First of all, um, what I want to do is I want to acknowledge the work that was done primarily by Nathan Beliveau, who's shown uh, in uh, the box, but also Stephanie Barnes and Bill Ireland and Susie Beeler and Justin Kenny. So we've had a really great time working together. So I have a little bit of trepidation giving this talk here, and part of the reason has to do with what I find to be, in some sense, a divide about the relevance of genomes and DNA and biology. So I was just at the ASCB meeting, that's American Society for Cell Biology. It's like 6,000 people were there in San Diego. And I think many of us were intrigued by the lack of discussion of DNA, which is fine. I mean, people were talking about really interesting stuff having to do with active matter and so on. And it made me think a little bit about Schrodinger's book, What is Life? So in this book, uh, the first five chapters are where he articulates his questions about the nature of the genetic material, which at this point is passé, is charming, whatever. You know, and there's different arguments about how important it was or was not to the development of modern, modern biology. I have no interest in getting into that. But the last chapter actually is on questions about what you might call active matter and how, what gives life its lifiness. And so Schrodinger had things to say about that, but in particular, I'm, I wanted to show you the year 2000 version of the same argument. So this is a wonderful paper that was written by Mark Kirshner, John Gerhardt, and Tim Mitchison. And it was written in a bit of a playful mood. Uh, and I'm going to read you this paragraph because it sets up my talk. So it says, at the close of the 20th century, genetics reigns triumphant as the central theme in biological thought. The sequence of the human genome is widely seen as the starting point for biological investigation in the next century, and the debate on the origin of life largely defines a life as equivalent to accurately transmitting a genetic blueprint. We do not question the importance of genetics nor dispute the role of DNA as the blueprint for all components of living systems, but we think it worth asking to what extent the post-genomic view of modern biology would convince a 19th century vitalist that the nature of life was now understood. How close are we to understanding how a single cell functions or how an embryo develops? If the answer is not so close, will true understanding of living systems come from further annotating the database of genes, or must we explore the chem physical chemical nature of living systems? In this essay, we discuss a few personal favorite examples, starting from macromolecular assembly and increasing in complexity and scale to patterning in vertebrate embryology. Our discussion illustrates the nature of biological organization and explores the potential chemical principles behind them. Although the units we consider, proteins, cells, and embryos, are manifestly the products of genes, the mechanisms that promote their function are often far removed from sequence information. In a lighthearted, millennial vein, we might call research into this kind of integrated cell and organismal bio physiology molecular vitalism. So that's a mouthful. But I could actually use this sort of for both parts of my group and both parts of my thinking. Today I'm going to talk about genomes. And part of the reason is because I feel that the question I started with, which is what is the meaning of this particular genomic sentence, we really don't know the answer to that. And so despite the promise of the genome, I think there's still a lot to consider. So here's the, the outline of the talk. I want to begin in, a some, in some sense just by setting the stage. And then I'm going to tell you about the main thing, which is this part. And you'll see what I mean by deciphering the genome when I get to that part of the talk. And then in light of that, in fact, the only reason I'm trying to decipher the genome, so to speak, is so that I could do the third part of the talk, which is the actual, let's call it the physics of how genomes work. So um, I think it's probably not surprising to anybody in this room if I, if I say that um, new instruments completely transform science. And I've always been a fan of Galileo and the Starry Messenger, in which he basically on several nights noted that Jupiter had some partners. There were four moons that he noticed, and they were dynamic. And so the, the telescope basically completely rewrote the history of astronomy 
And we're living through such a revolution of our own. And I think it's deeply impressive that as of 2017, the amount of sequence information deposited on the NIH databases was one followed by 15 zeros. I sent a mail out to my group asking everybody to tell me how many books of, or copies of Shakespeare that was worth. And the estimate we all came up with was something around 1.5 billion copies of Shakespeare. And I just want to say that if you contrast that with the number of books in the U.S. Um, Library of Congress, that's around 50 million books. So we have what I would say is a great thirst and almost a greed for sequence information. And today what I was saying in the, in the class was it kind of reminds me of what it would be like for me to order on my very already overly full Kindle just bo a book a day in Hindi, which I cannot understand a word of. You know, but I would just keep on greedily spending 9.99, you know, one click order and then you know shows up on your Kindle. So we are generating lots of sequence information. And what I would say is what does it all mean? So this harkens back actually to the early days of molecular biology and I really love this letter. This guy is George Gamov. He was a very very distinguished Russian theoretical physicist. He was just a touch too young to have been one of the key revolutionaries in the emergence of quantum mechanics. But he's the first guy that applied quantum mechanics to tunneling and figured out how to think about nuclear physics. In 1953, several months after the paper of Watson and Crick, he wrote the following letter. Dear Pauling, so written to Linus Pauling, who was at Caltech, I am playing with complex organic molecules, what I never did before. I am getting some amusing results and would like to hear your opinion about it. Okay, the first thing you notice is that you can be a really, really top-notch physicist and not be very good at spelling in English. <laughs> So, you know, he doesn't get getting, amusing, or opinion right. Ever since I read the article of Watson and Crick last June, I was trying to figure out how a long number written in a four-digital system, i.e. nucleic acid molecule, can determine uniquely, I love the spelling of uniquely, a correspondingly long word based on a 20-letter alphabet, i.e. an enzyme molecule. If you read Horace Freeland Judson's book, The Eighth Day of Creation, you'll hear about the RNA tie club and the very hard work that was put into trying to decipher the genetic code. It was awesome and truly amazing, and to my mind, you know, the experiments of Nuremberg is one of the greatest experiments I've ever heard of. So, you know, out of that came the genetic code. That's fine. But... There's many parts of the genome that are not associated with genes. Again, I know everyone knows that, but it's just as a reminder that there are parts of the genome that are devoted to regulation. And these sites that I show you here are regulatory binding sites. And so, you know, the, the problem for me is that the parts of the genome that do not code for proteins are enigmatic. And I'm going to try and prove that to you. So I want to prove it to you by... Um, well, let's see. Maybe I'll, start with, uh, I'll start with an exam in some sense. So what I'm curious to know is I'm going to give you four organisms, human, Drosophila, yeast, and E. coli. And I'm curious which one people think is the best understood. So how many think it's humans, just out of curiosity, biologically the best understood? No takers. How many think it's Drosophila? A few. How about yeast? A few takers. And what about E. coli? Okay, yeah, I'm in the same category. So, um, but I, I mean, I think there's cogent argu arguments for all of them. So this is my phone, and that's a picture of my phone. And right here um, is this app, which you can see, and that's called BioPsych. And what that is is the database of all the genes in E. coli. And one of the things that you can do, and I like to do as an experiment, is you can just randomly go through and pick a gene, and if you do, what you will find is that for 60% of the genes, we literally, and I mean literally, know nothing about how they're regulated. And here are two examples. So this is what the diagram looks like. They show where RNAP binds, and in some cases we don't even know that, but there's nothing about any other sort of regulatory proteins. No activators, no repressors, no binding sites, nothing. So, you know, my take on that is that it's kind of surprising that at in, in 2018, 2019, especially when people are inclined to say, that's so 1970s, you know, we're done with bacteria, we already understand E. coli and all, that in general, if I hand somebody some sequence for any promoter, 60% uh, of them, we will know nothing. 
So, you know, I love to draw these kinds of cartoons, but it turns out more than half the genome deserve these kinds of cartoons. We know nothing. So, um, so what I'm going to try and walk you through is some baby steps that we've been trying to take to go from the right-hand side to the left-hand side, because really my passion is to try to make predictions about how these kinds of architectures work. So let me tell you about the makeup of the regulatory genome in E. coli. And I think it would be very interesting to do this in other cases as well. So what I'm saying here, I'm trying to characterize a given architecture using two numbers. Zero, zero means there's zero binding sites for activators and zero binding sites for repressors. If I say one, zero, that means there's one binding site for an activator and zero for a repressor. This is a histogram of our current best understanding of E. coli where you can see the most prominent kinds of regulated architectures are either simple repression or simple activation. But the most common of all is constitutive, but I would have to say constitutive with quotes, because we really don't think at the end of the day that they're constitutive. And here's a little piece of evidence in that, re in that regard. So what I'm showing in blue is the number of genes, which at this point people generally think they know, and on, in red is the number of binding sites for transcription factors. You know, in other words, we continue to discover things about the regulatory setup of the, the E. coli and other genomes. So basically what I would like to know is how do I go from DNA sequence to these kind of coarse-grained representations that we can then use as statistical mechanicians to make predi predictions and then turn around and do measurements to try and test our understanding of what's going on. So with that as background, what I want to do is I want to tell you about this method uh, called SortSeq that was invented by Justin Kinney when he was a grad student at Princeton. So I was uh, asked to be the referee. This is one of these direct submissions to PNAS. And I remember very well when I got the paper, uh, I was on my group retreat and I, uh, I was six time zones away from those guys. And I just said, Justin, I have to talk to you about this. This is so incredibly interesting because I thought it might be an opportunity to crack this problem of the so-called well-understood E. coli or other genomes. So here's the concept in a nutshell. You have some promoter of interest that you would like to understand at the level that I just described, both at the level of saying, here's the binding sites, here, here's what the transcription factors are, and so on. And the concept is that the, we now take that promoter and use it to drive the expression of, of GF, GFP. Then you mutagenize the promoter at the 10% level. So imagine I have 200 base pair region in front of my gene, and we mutagenize it, roughly one out of every 10 bases. And we then measure the fluorescence using a cell sorter. So we sort the cells according to their level of fluorescence. The next step is to sequence. So at this point, now what we have is we have two identifiers for each strain. We have an identifier which is called level of expression, and we have a second identifier which is called sequence. So I have two labels assigned to each and every cell, and now we ask the question, can I learn something about what's going on in this thing? And that's this last part that I want to kind of try and tell you about. So the idea that Justin had that I thought was really cool, and this was one of the things that caught my eye, was the so-called information footprint. So what this information footprint is telling you is it's telling you about the extent to which the promoter cared if you mutagenized a particular base. So if I were to take a book, an English language book, and I had the word walk, and I were to mutagenize the letter W, then I could really ruin your understanding because, for example, maybe it's a book about baseball and there's a, a move that a pitcher makes called a balk, B-A-L-K, which is when the pitcher looks over at first base and makes a fake move and it leads to a penalty. But a pitcher also can throw something that's called a walk. Okay? So the bottom line is that the W is highly informative in that case. And so different letters have different degrees of information content. So as I mentioned in the abstract, if you happen to see this, the way that Justin was thinking about this was in the language of communication theory. And so 
Um, so what I want to do is just give you a little bit of a hint of, of the logic of how you can use information theory to try to answer this question of what the information is at different bases in the promoter. So Claude Shannon, shown here, was at Bell Labs. Already in the time of the telegraph, people had realized that they had long-distance communication problems, and one of the big issues in, say, the 1930s and 40s was that they could not successfully make a phone call between the East Coast and San Francisco. That was, the, that was basically the problem that Bell Labs was trying to tackle. They had figured out that they could put amplifiers in Denver, for example, but they found that the amplifiers put noise onto the signal, and I, being older than almost all of you, remember once upon a time, you know, the era when you had phones that you had to dial like that and that you held on to, I remember the hissing that you would hear. And the farther away somebody was, the more hissing. Like when you called Europe, it was a different sort of thing. And so he thought hard about these issues and he int introduced ideas of information. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the final paragraph of the, the Origin of Species in order to talk to you about this notion of information. So what Susie did here is she basically put together a list of the frequency of letters in this last paragraph of The Origin of Species. And, you know, if you play Scrabble, you're already used to this. Like, I find it very amusing to think about the worth of different letters in different languages. You know, like, how much is a K worth or a W or a Z in different languages? So... At any rate, this is the frequencies, but that's not the question that we're interested in. We're interested in the mutual information question. I want to know, if I'm in bin, bin number four, what's the chance that there's an A at site 12 in the promoter? Or alternatively, if I switch a, an item at number 12 from A to C, which bin will I be in? That's the mutual information question. So you can ask this in the context of Darwin's last paragraph, by constructing this matrix. And the matrix is basically answering the question of, if I have an N as a particular letter, what's the chance that the next letter is a G, for example? And you can see, the answer is high. So here's N, and there's G. So the, the probability is high. So there's a mutual information between N and G. Said differently, if we were going to play a game and you knew nothing, so a good example would be, let's say, that somebody does not know Hindi, for example. I don't exactly know how the language works, but you guys could play a game with me where I'm picking letters and trying to decide what the next letter is, and you would slaughter me because there's probably certain things that don't follow others. Like in general, R is not followed by Z in English, unless your name happens to be Polish, and then it's a proper thing and it's not allowed in Scrabble. Okay. So I actually know somebody with that name. So what's plotted here is the mutual information. It's saying, for example, that this base is highly informative. If you change this base, it's going to matter to the level of expression. And that might not surprise you because it's part of the RNA polymerase minus 10 binding site and so on. So you can see here is the binding site for the weak operator of the lac operon. Here is the binding site for the activator. This is a binding site for LAC, LAC I, the main binding site. And so uh, what we, we basically did was we spent the first few years of messing around with this just basically confirming that we could basically reconstruct what we already know about well-known regulatory architectures. And of all the regulatory architectures I can think of, there's none that we know better than the LAC operon, with the possible exception of the lambda phage switch. So... Um, we also are able to develop what's called an energy matrix. And this is a very powerful idea. And the idea is as follows. For every base, we assign effectively an energy. And what I mean by that is if I want to find how strongly the transcription factor binds, I basically will add up the contributions letter by letter by letter. It's an additive model. Maybe some of you will want to ask later whether or not we thought about higher order models. I will tell you the answer is yes. And it's not as interesting as you might think. And at the end of the day, this works reasonably well. But remember, my real goal is I want to basically take a whole genome and I want to be able to, to know what every site corresponds to in terms of its regulatory architecture. So basically, when we go through this procedure, we actually now have a hypothesis about binding sites. But that's only half the battle. Because if I don't know who binds to those binding sites, 
I still don't have the regulatory architecture figured out. So that brings us to, to the needle in the haystack problem. So this is a, a really interesting kind of weird live art guy. I don't know if any of you have heard of him, but he does this, uh, one of his shows is he goes to art museums and then he puts a stack of hay and then he has the art museum curator put a needle in the stack and then he sits there for 24 hours live and there's a webcam too and then he finds the needle. So that's, that's his art scheme. So I thought we would use Monet to contemplate this notion of a needle in a haystack. So if you think of a piece of hay as being about that long and having a diameter like about this, what you'll find is that there's between one and five million pieces of hay in a haystack. And that's exactly relevant to the transcription factor hunt problem. So what I'm showing you here is a beautiful experiment from Schmidt and Heinemann in which they use mass spec to characterize the proteome of E. coli. In blue at the top is the total number of proteins per cell. It's between, say, 3 million and 10 million. This in green is all the transcription factors added up. And here is the number of copies of LACI. And what I can tell you is most transcription factors in E. coli come in at copy numbers between 10 and 100. So it's very low compared to the total. So how do you go on this hunt? Well, one way you can do it is using mass spec. So this is what Nathan did. You break open the cells. Remember, he now has a candidate for what he thinks the binding site is. Because of the mutual information thing, we have an information footprint, which means we have a guess. We think that this site is a binding site. So now we'll use it as a fishing hook in order to fish out the transcription factor of interest. He takes a magnetic bead, he has this oligonucleotide, and he basically then fishes out the relevant proteins and then runs them on a mass spec. There's a trick having to do with using different isotopes that allows you to enrich, in other words, to eliminate nonspecific binding. And so this is the kind of plots that you get. And this is actually, I use the word advisedly, it's a discovery. What I'm showing you there is the first time that we or anyone else knew for this particular gene that that protein bound to that particular binding site. So that's the scheme. So just to summarize the protocol, the protocol this is kind of ugly uh, slide, but mutagenize the promoter library, sort the cells according to fluorescence, sequence, find the information footprint, determine the energy matrix, use the energy matrix to design oligos, fish out the transcription factor, find out what it is, and make cartoon. That's, that's victory in this thing. Is if we have a cartoon, we're good. So now I'm bet ready to go back to this genomic sentence. So we wanted to know what this particular genomic sentence means, and this is a particular gene which is uh, called pure T. And I really like this gene because it's got a, a sort of fun historical significance on several fronts. So this is a gene that's involved in purine synthesis and it's, it's interesting in several different ways. The, the first of which, I guess I'll say, is because of the history between Erwin Shargaff and Watson and Crick. So Shargaff was an Austrian, if I remember, biochemist. And he's the one, if some of you read The Double Helix by Watson, or alternatively, maybe in some biochemistry class, I have no idea what's taught in a biochemistry class, but the part where they tell us that the number of A's and T's is the same and the number of G's and C's is the same, those are the Shargaff rules. He's the one who figured that out. It, and if you read Watson, he'll say this is a big hint for them. And what I like is he wrote this very, very harsh autobiography called Heracletian Fire, and he's pretty fiery. And you can see what he had to say about Watson and Crick. Speaking of them, so far as I could make out, they wanted, unencumbered by any knowledge of the chemistry involved, to fit DNA into a helix. So, <laughs> you know, he wasn't that complimentary. But, you know, he was on the losing side of the judgment. And as I was telling the students today, you know, I think it's, I think it's interesting. Uh, Arthur Shaolau, who was one of the inventors of the laser, he had a beautiful comment. He said, in order to do research, you don't need to know everything. You just need to know something that's not known. The structure wasn't known. They had as good a shot at it as anybody else. So that's one reason I like this. The other reason this is quite related to the subject of allosteria, which is one of my favorite things. How do molecules know about their environment? How do you keep the purine and pyrimidine ratio right? And it has to do with factors, binding on, enzymes binding things, and either being turned on or turned off 
And, uh, you know, that's another, another talk, but another thing that I really, really love. So this is Nathan's work on this particular gene. As I said before, before he started, it's a virgin. We know nothing about this thing at all. Here's the information footprint. And I remember the first time that uh, Nathan came to my office, he said, look, this is minus 10, this is minus 35. And he had a very clever thought about going beyond the information footprint. He didn't like the information footprint because it lacks a sign. There's no way you can tell whether something's activating or repressing. So he decided, what does that base pair do to the shift in fluorescence? Does it increase fluorescence or reduce it? What would you think? Would a re re would a if you mutate a repressor, should fluorescence go up or down? Yeah, and an activator should go down, so it won't work as well. So that gave him a hint. He thought, ah, that's going to be a repressor binding site. I remember him telling me that. And so we were super excited when he was going to do the mass spec, which he did, and out popped PureR. So the upshot of all this is that, uh, that he's tackled a number of different genes. And, you know, we went from this, which is a mess, to that which are cartoons that, you know, if I'm in my statistical mechanician mode, I now know how to do a calculation. I have a hypothesis about the ar regulatory architecture, and now we can unleash what I'm going to tell you in the next part of the talk. So this is the before, and that's the after. And that's that, so that's the sort of the methodology. Where are we now? So I have a, a student named Bill Ireland, and I really, he's a physics guy. Uh, when he was an undergrad, he worked on high-energy experiments in mines. You know, the ones where they fill up huge mines with water, heavy water and stuff, and try to detect particles. And um, he bravely came into my group and he said, you know, I like this method. I want to try and do the whole genome. And I, I, that's music to my ears. Because the dream that I have is to have an energy... I want to have... Go out into the world with, uh, with the, the submersible Alvin, have... Victoria Orphan, who's my colleague at Caltech, come back with a bunch of mud and sequence and know the full energy matrix of whole genomes of brand new organisms in a weak time scale. So what uh, Bill has done is he has started over. This thing is not high throughput enough. So what he did is he basically redid this whole methodology using RNA-seq. So now he can do many, many genes at once with barcoding. And this is just to give you a little bit of an indication that as concerns the hypothesis of how the thing, the, the regulatory arch architectures are set up, the two methods seem to agree well enough. The reason I'm being a little bit ambivalent about this is that we were never able to actually assign true meaning to the number of bits per a given base, to my disappointment. In other words, I thought it was going to be a powerful quantitative thing, but at the end of the day, I don't think we're on top of that. So we can still try and figure out how the regulatory architecture is wired, but the, the actual heights of these peaks, I don't have anything to tell you. Okay, so what I've told you up till now is there's a problem, which is if, it's, if we know only 30% of the regulatory genome in E. coli, just imagine what it is, for example, in B. subtilis or in Salmonella or whatever. It's just worse, or Vibrio cholera. So once we have uh, a picture of the regulatory architecture of a given gene, then we can do the thing that I really want to do. So this is, this is the last part of my talk, but this is really the passion of what I want to do in my group. And it has to do with trying to basically make predictions about how regulatory architectures work and, um, and then to test those predictions. So I'm going to spend a few minutes telling you about a, an idea of that, that really drives the way we function in my group, and I'm going to refer to it as figure one theory. So let me tell you what I mean by that. So, you know, one of the classic case studies of all of biochemistry and uh, biology is hemoglobin. Such a cool molecule, such a, a wonderful story on so many levels, having to do with structural biology and Max Perutz. But my favorite part in many ways has to do with this, and that's been known for more than 100 years. These are data from Christian Bohr, the father of Niels Bohr. And this is the discovery, effectively, of what's called, called the Bohr effect. So what one sees here is that there are binding curves. It depends on the pH or the CO2, and that's fine. And you can write down 
retrospectively, after the fact, you can write down a model called the mono wyman schanja model. This is the key model of Alistairi. And then, if you're careful, as was shown in this absolutely fantastic paper from an Israeli group just two years ago, and I'll just use a temporary second to make a slight critical remark about our world of publishing. These guys had to publish their paper in PLOS One. To my mind, it's one of the best papers I've seen in a long, long time, but you know, it's, it's basically this kind of work. You know, like be careful and actually know what you're talking about. And so they were able to show that all of these different data sets can be fit with one minimal parameter set, okay? Most people thought it was not possible, but they were just careful. And so this is figure seven theory. There's no predictions, it's just retrospective. There's data out there, you write down the model, and the model works, okay? That's very different from this, which is figure one theory. So this is a famous paper from uh, 1953, if I remember correctly. I don't know why it's not projecting well. Um, but this is the paper from Asakura and Osawa in which they introduced the idea of depletion forces. What do I mean by de depletion forces? I mean that if I push this thing down here to closer than the radius of these particles, it'll give these particles more room for their entropy. So it's a strictly entropic force. And it leads to all sorts of wild and cool things like this, which is if you take rods and spheres and mix them together, they will form an ordered structure to make the entropy higher, which sounds completely contradictory. But the entropy is higher in that state than in the state where they're, they're all randomly aligned. And what they say in this paper is direct experimental proof of the reality of this effect is lacking. And my attitude about that is, Good job, you know. Theory is ahead of experiment. It took 50 years until this thing was done. If I remember correctly, it's Arjun Yod, who's actually at UPenn. 50 years. But the theory was ahead of experiment, and, you know, I don't believe in tail between the legs apology for theory being ahead of experiment. I think this is what we should be proud of. So this is figure one theory. And what I want to do is I want to tell you about figure one theory in the context of the classic model of gene expression that was originally articulated by Jacob and Monod. So what's shown here is their paper from the early 60s in which they introduced the so-called repressor operator model. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you about two approaches, one using equilibrium ideas, the other using kinetic ideas, making predictions, and then trying to test them. So what I'm going to do is talk to you about the simple repression motif. It's, it's this one, which is very, very common in E. coli. What do I mean by simple repression? There's a promoter, there's one binding site for a repressor, and there's only one repressor. At least that's our current state-of-the-art knowledge of many of these repressors. And what I'm going to tell you about is a progressive addition of complexity. We're going to start with the simplest case. We're going to determine a few parameters. And then, as my student Manuel beautifully said in his talk last week uh, at a Gordon conference, we're going to put the parameters in a safe, and we're going to lock the safe, and we're not allowed to take them out again. They're stuck. They're fixed. We are not going to change them. Then we're going to do the next thing in this progression, and there may be one new parameter that we need, but these we're going to inherit. So, you know, when somebody builds a bridge, they do not redo, refit the, the elastic moduli of steel. They're measured. They're closed in the safe. So, theoretically, I don't have time to go into the details, but you can either use a kinetic description of what's going on in this promoter. So what's the picture? The promoter's empty, a repressor binds, it's closed for business. The repressor's empty, polymerase binds, and then RNA is transcribed. So that's described by these various rate constants, and you can compute the probability of each one of these states, and the probability the gene is on is proportional to the probability of this state and this state alone. This is not a transcribing state, nor is the, sorry, I p pointed the wrong one, this one. This is the transcribing state, and so this is the probability that my gene is on. Notice that R, the number of repressors, is in the denominator. So if I put more repressors, I get less expression, as it should be. So this theory makes predictions. It predicts that the level of expression shown on the y-axis goes down as you increase the number of repressors. And there's a formula 
So basically, this is the figure one theory, if you'll allow me to use those words. And what the formula says is that the amount of gene expression goes like one over, this is the number of repressors, and this is how tightly the repressor binds onto the DNA. Those are two parameters that we can access experimentally by using cloning effectively. So the question is, how can we make these measurements? Notice that on this axis, it says number of repressors. But like most people, we, we've done a fluorescent fusion. So somehow we have to find a way to eliminate the arbitrary units. In other words, I can't test what we're doing if this axis says arbitrary units. It actually has to be 100 repressors right here. So this gives me a chance to tell you about uh, what I would call standard candles, so something that I love. So one of my all-time favorite scientists is Henrietta Leavitt. She was an astronomer at Harvard in the year 1910, and she made a huge discovery, which is uh, shown in the lower right. And let me just quickly tell you what the idea is. There are certain stars known as Cepheid variables that get bright, and then they get dim, and they get bright, and then they get dim. They have a periodicity. And her discovery was that the absolute magnitude depends on the period. Said differently, if you look out into the world and you see a star and you measure its period and you measure its apparent magnitude, then you can figure out its absolute magnitude using the inverse square law. That's her discovery. And for example, Edwin Hubble, when he wrote his paper, it was absolutely predicated on using these stars. And the Hubble telescope has a whole story of recalibrating the Cepheid variables. Here you can see, this is 1910, there's the data right there on the wall. So we need a standard candle for fluorescence, and as it happens, there was a really, really nice work from uh, Nitzan Rosenfeld and Jonathan Young, who were grad students with Yuri Alon and uh, Michael Elowitz, respectively. And it's very simple to tell you what the idea is. The, the assumption is that the fluorescence is proportional to the number of fluorophores. So as long as they're not too much density in weird photophysics, I think that's a quite reasonable thing to assume. Brightness of the cell is proportional to the number of repressors. The thing is, we don't know the coefficient alpha. That's the thing that's missing. So here's their very interesting idea, and with apologies to the, the class, I'm going to take these four guys right here. You guys have already, some of you have seen me do this. But these four guys are the four repressor molecules. If you were born on an even day, you four, raise your hand. Uh, it's ruined. <laughs> No, that's all right. So I got two going to one daughter and two going to the other daughter. I hope this works out better this time. All right. You four, if you were born on an odd day, please raise your hand. Yeah. So, okay, this time three to one. Now this is a group right here of one, two, three, four, five, I can't even count anymore. Six. You six, if you were born in an even year, raise your hand. So two out of the six. Okay, what is my point? My point is, is that each, if each one of these proteins flips a coin, there's going to be heterogeneity in the division process. Sometimes it'll turn out like this. Sometimes it'll turn out like that. Sometimes it'll turn out like that. Each time it will turn out differently. And they had this beautiful insight that you could calculate the coefficient alpha, which is shown right here, just by using the binomial distribution. In other words, by measuring the fluctuations, you could figure out the expression. So here's what this experiment looks like. So you start out at t equals zero with a bunch of repressors. They were red. As the cell divides, it basically is partitioning in a binomial fashion the fluorescent proteins. Here's what it looks like. And so we can actually construct a graph as follows. Each data point is one cell division. The x-axis is the intensity of the mother. The y-axis is the difference in intensity of the two daughters squared. That's all there is to it. Although it's very hard to do the segmentation carefully and to know the, the numbers. But you take a cell, you measure the mother's inten uh, fluorescence intensity. The cell divides. There's two daughters. You figure out their intensity, and you take the difference and square it. That's all these points. This curve right here, or this fit, gives you this parameter alpha. And now we can do the confrontation of the figure one theory with the experiments. And so here, what I'm showing you, there are basically no free parameters. It's just a matter of laying the data down on top of the predicted curves.
So that's fine. Now let me tell you about uh, taking this really all the way to the finish line in a super interesting way, I thought. What if I take some plasmids, N of them, and they have a binding site for the repressor? They don't do anything other than just bind repressors. That's their only job. I put plasmids in the cell, and they have a binding site for my repressor. So what are they going to do? They're going to suck repressors out of circulation. You can also use the same statistical mechanics that I just mentioned in order to make a calculation. There's no free parameters around. And note, this is a log-log plot. This structure on a log-log plot is weird. You know, in general stuff, like if you look at my previous thing, these things became sort of trivial on a log-log plot. But in this case, it's actually quite non-trivial. And so we had these predictions, and um, Rob Brewster came to my office, and he said, I'm really disappointed. Uh, it just doesn't seem to work out. And I, and I said, oh, man, that's, that's really a bummer. And he went away, and like two hours later, he came running to my office, and he said, I was using the numbers from that previous experiment off the top of my head, and I actually didn't remember them right. <laughs> and here's what it w really came out to. So, you know, it, it, re it seemed to really hold together very nicely. And it, go it goes even farther, because there's a hidden variable. And I want to tell you what I mean by hidden variable. So there's a beautiful paper by Joe Keller called The Prob Probability of Heads. And then there's a wonderful follow-up uh, paper that some of you might have seen by Mahadevan, which was in Physics Today. So here's the idea. The hidden variable is if I tell you that I'm going to flip a coin, and you're astute enough to know what the initial upward velocity is, and you know the initial rotational velocity, you actually will know if it's a heads or a tails. And that's what these bands are. These are bands of heads and tails and heads and tails. And in a really weird twist of fate, some of you might have heard of the mathematician Percy Diaconis. He's a really famous probabilistic guy. He decided, of all things, to build an experiment to test this theory, and they, they could throw heads every time. So we have a hidden variable in this case. So it turns out that the cell doesn't care what the copy number is. The cell cares about the combination of copy number, e to the minus binding strength, and a thing related to the chemical potential due to those other plasmids. And that's the actual quantity. If you plot all of, this is 10 years of effort in my group, it just falls on one master curve without any, any fit other than just trying to find out what the natural variable of the problem is. Um, so, uh, so basically, I think uh, I think I'm actually I must have deleted a few slides, but it's 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 all right. Um, so I think I'm basically to the the end of my talk. So let me tell you what I think I've tried to to tell you. So, um, so the dream is. Whoa, I don't know what just happened, but. Um, Sorry, just bear with me. I think this one slide is really uh, touchy, that one. Okay, so, uh, so I tried to convince you, well, you, first, you tried to convince me that E. coli is the best understood organism. Then I tried to convince you that for s roughly 70% of the genes, we don't know anything about how they're regulated. And if you actually take you know, bugs out in the, the world, just interesting stuff, we more or less know nothing. And, um, and so what I would say is that the dream, as far as I'm concerned, is I would like to be able to take a whole genome and turn it into a series of cartoons like this, compute energy matrices. So I'd like to have a rainbow diagram around the whole genome that looks like that. And then to develop a series of statistical mechanical hypotheses about the input-output response of those gene networks. And really the dream is, as I said before, and this is a very serious dream, is uh, I have a colleague named Victoria Orphan, and she gets to go down in Alvin uh, three or four times a year, and she goes to the, surf the floor of the ocean and she pulls up bacteria and archaea, and we actually have been interested in this idea of like on the 10-year time scale, being able to just take a, an organism that's never been seen before and not just sequence it, but have an energy matrix for the entire genome. And you know, just to, to, 
harass ourselves, say, do that on less than a one-week time scale. So, you know, there's, there's parts of the story that are in hand. You know, I told you about the, the use of the, the RNA-seq as a way to find the information footprints and the energy matrices. We're still a little stuck on how to be high throughput on the, the mass spec. Um, these inference techniques have been really powerful and interesting for, from the standpoint of developing the energy matrices, and we've been working very hard on trying to see if we have these energy matrices, can we just redesign genomes? Because the bottom line is that if we believe these energy matrices, I ought to be able to tune the binding sites at will to various strengths, and then they should behave accordingly. So that's, uh, that's what I got. Um, I guess I want to just especially thank Nathan, who uh, did a really brave thing. You know, he joined my group. We had never worked with any of this stuff. He didn't write a paper until the year he graduated, which was year six of grad school. Um, and I just got a mail from Julie Terrio, who he's a postdoc with now. And she said he just gave his first group meeting last week, and he's a gem. Um, and I already knew that. And I was very happy to hear that. He's a, he's a rel rather taciturn guy, but really, really did fantastic stuff. And then, um, and then Franz Weinert and Rob Brewster are really the ones who pushed that thing about the data collapse and so on. I like this comment from John Wheeler. The real reason universities have students is to educate the professors, and there's no one that that's more true of than me. Um, I feel very lucky to be at Caltech. I feel very lucky to be here this week, and I'm happy to take questions, and great to see all of you. Thank you again. Thank you.